Now it's our turn. I am Andrea Schmidt. I am Tamara Patarice. In this week, you will learn about dreams, visions, magic and supernatural beliefs in various religions. In the first three videos, we will present a story that became fundamental for the belief of Christians in the Near East and in the Caucasus. It is the story of a miraculous portrait of Jesus Christ. Since ancient times, Christians have been curious to find out what Jesus, the Son of God, according to their belief, actually looked like. Did he look like this, like this, or like that, or that, or that one? In fact, nobody really knows what Jesus looked like. The Bible tells us nothing about his physical characteristics, his size, or even his hair, or eye color. But Christian believers were not content with that and tried to discover the truth through inspiration and other means of revelation. Even in very early times, Aramaic Christians in Syria were curious about Jesus' looks and they were the first to turn this question into a fascinating story. This story circulated for more than a thousand years. It found its way into many other countries in the Near East, from the south in Ethiopia via I Egypt and Byzantium up to the north in the Caucasus. Our story begins in the ancient village of Edessa. Today, Edessa is called Urfa. It is a small town in southern Turkey, near the border with Syria. But in early Christian and medieval times, Edessa, Urfa, was the capital of a wealthy Aramaic kingdom in Syria. Syria Christians of Edessa were proud to speak Aramaic, a language similar to Jesus' mother tongue. Aramaic Christians of Edessa also took pride in a story which belonged to their ancient literature. This story is about Jesus' portrait. It tells us about Abga, the Syria king of Edessa. He ruled at the time when Jesus was still alive. Abga was very ill. Hearing about the miracles Jesus was performing in Jerusalem, he sent his secretary named Hanan. Hanan, this is a Syriac name for John, carried a letter of invitation to Jesus, requesting him to come to Edessa to cure King Abga and to preach among his people. Jesus received Abga's message with joy, but declined the invitation. He said, that he first had to fulfill his mission of salvation on earth. However, he promised to send after his resurrection the Apostle Adai, who would heal King Abka and convert the people in Edessa to Christian belief. And then our old Zurich story records. When Hanan saw that Jesus spoke thus to him, by virtue of being the king's painter, he took and painted the likeness of Jesus with choice pigments. And he brought it with him to Abgar the king, his master. King Abgar received the portrait of Jesus with joy and placed it with great honor in one of the rooms of his palace. Christians all over the world came to Edessa to venerate the holy image, or what they believed to be the true portrait of Jesus. They believed that it had a healing and protecting power. Now, did this encounter of Abga's messenger with Hanan really happen? Was there really a portrait of the living Jesus sent from Jerusalem to Edessa? The truth is, our story cannot be considered a historical document. Even though it is very old, it is a fictional story, a so-called 
apocryphal text. It only pretends to be from the time of Jesus. Actually, the text was written in the early 4th century. For what purpose then was this fictional story invented? In the 4th century, Christianity was not yet firmly established as a major religion in the Near East. Christians from Edessa had to cope with several rival religions. Our text belongs to Christian propaganda literature. It wanted to declare the superiority of Christianity over other religions in Edessa and it wanted to satisfy the curiosity of Christians about the human appearance of their God, Jesus. Soon, the story of King Abga and Jesus' portrait spread from Edessa to other countries. It was translated into many languages. As always, when information passed on through other languages and cultures, the story undergoes transformations and develops into many variations. In the next video, we'll see just how the story developed. Welcome back. So what kind of reworking happened to our story of the true portrait of Jesus? At the end of the 6th century, the legend gets a decisive boost and develops into two main variations. In the first, the image is no longer made by the painter Hanan in front of Jesus in Jerusalem. The image becomes nothing less than a miraculous self-portrait, not made by human hands. The idea here is that human beings are not able to paint the glorious face of God Jesus. The image must have been given by Jesus himself. And in the second, Instead of a, on a picture, of a picture on an icon, the image of Jesus becomes a supernatural picture on a piece of cloth. Henceforth, this portrait, not made by human hands on cloth, is known by the Greek, Greek concept of mandylion. Once again, it is a Zurich apocryphal text, this one from the end of the 6th century, which records a variation of the story about the portrait of the Mandylion. Let's hear the ancient text itself. Abgar called skilled painters and he ordered them to go along with his messengers to Jerusalem, depict and bring back in a picture, the face of our Lord, as if the king encountered Christ personally. The painters arrived in Jerusalem, but they were not able to paint the image of the Lord's adorable human features. So, when our Lord Christ realized, through his divine understanding, the love of King Abgar for him, and Having seen that the painters couldn't paint his image as he was, Jesus took a cloth and imprinted his face on it, and it turned out as Jesus really was. The earliest church image showing this variation of the story is a 10th century icon in the monastery of St. Catherine on the Sinai. The icon shows King Abgar sitting on the throne while his messenger from Jerusalem presents him the portrait on cloth, the Mandelion, with the features of Jesus' face on it. 
Jesus over face has strong eyebrows, brown hair and a short beard. Long strands of hair fall on both sides. It is this depiction of Jesus' face that henceforth becomes one of the most reproduced images in the iconography of Byzantine art and Eastern Christian art. The icon kept in St. Catherine's Monastery was painted at the time when the portrait of Jesus was transferred in 944 from Edessa to the Byzantine capital Constantinople. It was kept in the collection of the treasures in the Imperial Palace. It became one of the holiest relics in the Byzantine capital. This miniature in a Byzantine manuscript, now kept in the National Library of Madrid, illustrates the transfer of the picture to Constantinople. It shows how the Byzantine emperor, surrounded by his dignitaries, receives the portrait of Jesus. He embraces and kisses it. At this period, in the 10th century, many other variations of the story of Jesus' portrait were already circulating and in different languages. One important variation tells how the portrait was miraculously duplicated and brought into other towns so that these cities too could possess a copy of the image of the Mandelion, not made by human hands. This copy is known as the Keramion. What does Keramion mean? It is a Greek word for brick. But let's hear the story itself. King Apka was journeying upon the road with his escort back from Jerusalem. They came to the city of Mabuk. They remained overnight outside the city in the shop of a potter. Out of fear of robbers, they placed the portrait of Christ between two bricks. Then they slept. Now, during the night, there came down a dark pillar of fire upon the portrait. And when the guards of that city passed by and saw this grand wonder, they were amazed and cried out. Then they detected that the identical copy of the portrait was fixed firmly to on one brick. Now let's have a quick look at Arabic tradition, in which this story circulated as well. Here we have to distinguish between the Muslim and Christian Arabic traditions. According to Islam, Jesus Christ is a prophet and not at all the Son of God. Therefore, the Muslim Arabs were less concerned with the question of Jesus' true image than the Arabic-speaking Christians. But several Christian Arabic authors liked to recall the story of Jesus' portrait. They often used the story as an argument in polemics with Muslims. Muslims considered the Christian veneration of images as idolatry. Thus, a Christian Arab bishop of the 9th century named Theodora Bukhura wrote a treatise on the duty of Christians to maintain the veneration of icons. One of his main arguments concerns our portrait of Jesus. Another testimony in the Arabic language is given by a Coptic priest from Egypt at the beginning of the 13th century named Abu al-Makarim. He was the author of a kind of ge ecclesiastical geography. In the following videos by our colleagues, you will hear again about this Coptic author. Now, Abu al-Makarim 
writes about two distinct portraits of Jesus. One portrait is a mandelion stored in a desert, and the other one is a mandelion stored in the imperial church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. The images of Jesus are already proliferating. Jesus' portrait, or, or the mandelion, was not only considered to be authentic, but also full of healing power. It was used as a talisman. This 14th century amulet scroll in Greek and Arabic from the Beermont Morgan Library in New York testifies to the miraculous power attributed to Jesus' image. The mandelion became a prominent painting in Byzantine and Eastern Christian art. In our next video, a movie will further highlight the importance of the mandelion, Jesus' image not made by human hand, of ancient and present Christian piety. Let's see how the mandelion and its story spread as far as the Caucasus in Armenia and Georgia. back again and now we want to show how the story of Jesus' portrait was brought from Byzantium and the Near East to further north. Christianity in Armenia and Georgia is very old. Very early on Armenians and Georgians became acquainted with the story of the portrait of Jesus. They translated it into their own languages and, as is always the case with cultural transfers, the story was reworked according to their own cultural understanding. Thus, in an early Armenian translation of the 5th century, the story is related in a form similar to that of the original Syriac text. Jesus was portrayed by King Abgas' messenger in Jerusalem. Jesus' portrait is not a mandelion. It is still a miraculous, it's not an imprint on cloth. It is still an icon on wood. It is interesting the Armenian version attests to certain cultural reworking. Abga, the Syrian king of Edessa, is now presented as a king of Armenia. On the other hand, the version of Geramion, the copy of the image on a brick, and the version of the Mandelion are also recorded in Armenian literature. Here again, the Armenian versions assume a national reworking. For example, the cloth with which Jesus wiped his face becomes now the personal napkin of King Abgar. That's the text itself. John came and saw Jesus and tried to capture his beauty on Abgar's napkin. But he was unable because Jesus' face was transformed to glory and rejoiced. And so Jesus asked John for the napkin of Abga, put it over his face and impressed his features upon it. And then he returned it to the painter. The image was brought to Abga and it worked many great miracles. Jesus' portrait was also known in Georgia, again with variations. Let us now turn to the National Manuscript Center in Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. A precious manuscript is kept there, the so-called Gospel of Alaverdi. 
The manuscript was written and richly decorated in the middle of the 11th century. It contains the four Gospels. At the end, it tells the story of Abgar and how his messenger painted the portrait of Jesus in Jerusalem. A very special feature of this manuscript is that the story is illustrated in five images. Let's open it and have a look. The first illustration shows King Abgar on his bed, writing to Jesus and asking to visit him in his city. And the next illustration shows Abgar's painter kneeling before Jesus, requesting a painting of his face. The text written in the old Georgian script tells us what we already know, that the painter couldn't paint Jesus. So Jesus took a cloth and wiped his face, leaving his features on the mandelion. The next picture shows Jesus in Jerusalem, receiving Abgar's letter. Here we have an image which, which shows the mandelion. It is a rectangular cloth with Jesus' face on it. The Georgian text says that the Abgar was healed by the mandelion after he had touched it. Then Abgar ordered the destruction of the statues of idols in Edessa and their replacement by the portrait of Jesus. How does the story go on? in our manuscript. Very interestingly, the text repeats the story of the Karamion, the portrait on a brick, as we have heard it before. According to Georgian tradition, this copy of Jesus' image on a brick was brought from Syria to Georgia. Let's now go into the center of the capital of Georgia, Tbilisi. We will visit a very old church built in the 5th century. It is called Anchishati Church. The name of church means Church of the Anchi Icon. It is so named because it kept the Keramion Icon, which was brought to Tbilisi from the village of Anchi in southern Georgia in 1660. On the occasion of its transfer from Anchi to Tbilisi, a religious chant was composed, the chant of the Anchi icon. <laughs> Jesus' portrait as Mandilion or Geramion is very important in Georgian art. You can find it, it on frescoes in Georgian churches. Above the entry of the church, we see a fresco with the Keramion type of Jesus' portrait. The Anchi icon is very precious. Today, it is no longer kept in the church, but we can see it in the Georgian National Museum. Let's go there. Here is the Anchi icon. A famous Georgian goldsmith made it in 1180 and integrated it into a triptych. On the frame, you see an inscription in old Georgian script. It recalls how the icon was brought from Edessa to Constantinople and how it finally arrived in Georgia and was kept in the Anchis Chati church in Tbilisi. Some traditions even go on to claim that the Keramion, the copy of Jesus' portrait, was brought to the monastery of Martkopi. The Martkopi monastery is in eastern Georgia. It was founded in the 6th century by a Syrian monk. The monk is supposed to have brought the portrait from Syria to this monastery. Here you see his tomb. Above, a modern Georgian icon shows him with Jesus' portrait. However, 
The supposed original <coughs> Keramion is considered to have been lost since the Mongol invasions in Georgia. What do we know of the whereabouts of our Zurich story and the so-called holy portrait of Jesus? Little is known. The Crusaders came into contact with the story when they occupied Edessa and Constantinople in the 12th and 13th centuries. Did they bring the portrait to Western Christianity? Following the siege of Constantinople by the Crusaders in 1204, the portrait and other relics could have been brought to the Latin West but its traces are lost. Latin writers took up the ancient story from Syria. They adapted it and merged it with local Western traditions. One prominent conflation of the original motif with Western legend is the Whale of Veronica. This legend also tells the story of a wondrous imprint of Jesus' face on a cloth. Jesus left his features on Veronica's veil as he walked his way to Golgotha. However, like the Syriac painter Hanan of King Abgar, Veronica is not a historical person. Her name is a fusion of the Latin words vera icona, the true image. Her story is a strictly different tradition of Western Christianity, which goes beyond the scope of our topic. We hope you have learned something new and surprising about old Syriac legend from the Christian Near East that has often fascinated people, the physical appearance of Jesus Christ. As you have seen, this idea has acquired a great dimension over the centuries, and it has traveled from the various countries in the Near East and the Caucasus to medieval Europe. The next video will be about an entirely different phenomena, yet one which also transcends geographical boundaries the craft of alchemy.